Good morning, SDFM. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here with you today. I was here as a student presenting a poster. I came again as a resident and presented at a session. So it's really wonderful to be reconnected with SDFM, with the leadership in this room. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about PCORI today. But coming to Washington, D.C., out of clinical training and as a faculty member, it was really an honor to start to think about this organization and the difference we could make. In particular, I was joining an organization that was about 20 people big. It was very teeny. And I thought, why not take a chance on this new organization? I don't know what they're about yet. I don't know much about clinical effectiveness research and what it really means to do CER. But I believed in the idea that we could have patients involved and these principles of community-based participatory research that I learned in residency and fellowship really seemed to resonate with me. So I'm going to talk to you about what PCORI is doing, where we came from, but I'm also going to talk to you about the three main areas that we're funding now, a little bit about our programs and how you can apply and how you can be involved in PCORI and what we're doing differently. But as I mentioned, I joined this organization at a time of huge political debate. I've been there about two and a half years. And at that time, I didn't even know if I could actually do what they were asking me to do. It was right after 2010. We didn't know if the Supreme Court was going to uphold the Affordable Care Act. And there was huge debate about what CER was and what it meant to patients. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that story. Some of people's concerns have grown out of bogus claims that we plan to set up panels of bureaucrats with the power to kill off senior citizens. It is a lie, plain and simple. Plain and simple. Nothing has drawn as much controversy as the so-called death panels. There are no so-called death panels. So how many of you remember this debate? <laughs> yeah. So you know there was a huge divide. And this is actually part of what PCORI is and who we became. But somehow, this discussion about what healthcare should do and what the evidence should be really became a debate about death panels, believe it or not, and about rationing. Well, eventually, PCORI moved through that period, and the debate ended up having us set up as an organization that was independent, not affiliated with the government, so that we could create our own systems and our own strategies that were really about making a difference for patients. It was no longer just about cost and outcomes. They disconnected that. And now we're really just talking about clinical care and clinical evidence. But we know there's a lot of evidence out there today. And you, as educators and leaders, know this more than anyone else, because we're all trying to keep up with evidence that's out there. There are over 1.2 to 1.6 million papers published every year. How the heck are we supposed to keep up with that? I know I can't, and I only see patients about four hours a week. So this is really difficult. We also know that people have estimated it takes about 17 years to get evidence into practice. Well, our patients need the evidence now, and we as clinicians need the evidence much more quickly than 17 years. We also know that every year there are many randomized clinical trials out there. Over 180,000 are actually registered on clinicaltrials.gov every year. Do we keep up with all of those? I know it's hard for me to do. We also know that there, these trials generate evidence. There's a lot out there. There are about 16,000 studies that have findings published every year. They're supposed to be publicly available. But a lot of this is actually not published at all. It's just out there, and we hope to find the evidence in a few articles every year. We also know that the NIH's budget is huge, almost $30 billion. How much of that goes to family medicine? Less than 3%. PCORI is really trying to make a difference in that. Our budget every year is somewhere around $500 million. This comes from the PCOR Trust Fund that was set up in the legislation. Insurers pay our bill, but so do taxpayers. 
And part of this money should be going to answer questions relevant to family medicine and relevant to primary care. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how PCORI is trying to do this. Our organization was set up to fund patient-centered outcomes research. It's a type of clinical comparative effectiveness research. It's really about how we come together, how we get evidence that's useful and will create an impact. Our board set up our mission and our strategic goals, and we're trying to achieve this over time. But we're a new organization. When I joined, I would say we were sort of a startup. We, we didn't know. I was doing slides and all kinds of stuff. No, nothing connected to my clinical background or my training. But now we've evolved. We're really trying to figure out how to do this and impact real world questions and generate real world evidence. Our mission was set up to do this, coming from patients and stakeholders and really making a difference. It won't work without each of you in the room and your students and your residents helping us find better evidence along the way. It's part of why I joined the organization because I believe that using these principles of community based participatory research really can make a difference. By generating questions from the community, we hope to generate impactful evidence at the end. <clears throat> these are our three strategic goals. We're trying to increase the quantity, quality of useful evidence along the way. It's not just about funding 180,000 trials or creating papers that no one will read but we really want to create evidence that people will use every day. We're also trying to speed the implementation of this work. So no more 17 years of waiting for the evidence to somehow get to our hands for our patient clinical encounters. But how do we speed this up? How do we do this more quickly? It's still something we're figuring out. We haven't really generated much in terms of findings yet, but we're hoping that having Stakeholders involved, organizations involved, along the way will make a difference. And lastly, we're trying to influence that $30 billion that NIH is funding. We need evidence that's useful, but we also need to have a process that makes sense. And so by funding, we're trying to also influence other funders, make sure that our research is making a difference along the way, and that by doing this, we're gonna change the way NIH and ARC and other organizations fund research. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing that's so different and why we think it's so different. So our legislation laid out pretty explicitly what we should be doing, and it also said that we have to be really attuned to the fact that dissemination matters and how we can do this more quickly. So each of you know there's a fork in the road that often comes in when a patient comes in front of you. <clears throat> We're trying to decide what makes a difference for them given certain circumstances. And this is the type of work that we fund. We're really trying to figure out comparisons of real decisions that people are making every day. We know that 90% of decisions are made by clinicians in our huge healthcare economy. And we're trying to change that a little bit. Focus on shared decision making. Focus on ideas that really are patient-centered. And that take into account who a particular person is given their circumstances, given their complexities, given their preferences. And it's not easy to do, but this is part of what we're, what we're set up to do. We say patients are our true north. It's not about figuring out what is an interesting research question. Freddie just talked about getting to that right question. Well, you have to ask the people who are going to use that. Oftentimes it's clinicians, but sometimes patients want to know, what should I be really thinking about? What are the decisions that I need to make when I'm given the, this particular healthcare issue? And so we're doing research that's set up to think about this from beginning to end, from generating the question to reviewing and conducting the research, but also when we're disseminating the findings. This is the hard part. And it's still a hypothesis that we're testing. We're trying to figure out if this really makes a difference. If having patients involved from beginning to end 
really will make something more useful and more impactful. And I hope that each of you will think about how we can do that together. <clears throat> we have many stakeholders who are involved. Our stakeholder community is huge and broad. Our evidence is supposed to be used by decision makers, but we know that decision makers sometimes aren't just the clinicians and aren't just the patients, but sometimes they're industry, payers, educators, academic institutions, and we're trying to bring everyone's insight together. So we have these stakeholder groups represented on our advisory panels, on work groups, when we're trying to figure out what the best questions are. We also have them involved in our merit review, and we're trying to think about how to get those perspectives involved along the way, so that at the end of the day, all of these individuals are not only helping us get refunded, hint, hint, but we're also hoping that they are involved in disseminating and implementing these results right away. So this concept of engagement is really core to what we do. And it wasn't built into our legislation. It's just something we think is important. Having patients and other decision makers involved, we believe is a tool to build a community that will help us create better evidence. This idea of creating a PCOR community is so important to us. How many of you have heard about PCORI before? How many of you are merit reviewers or have applied to be one? See a few hands. So I don't need to tell you, if you've heard the PCORI talk, you've heard about our ideas of engagement. I'll say that we're still figuring out what this means every day, and we see all kinds of models in our applications. Sometimes it's advisory panels or advisory boards. But we have people who take it so far as to have patients and stakeholders as co-investigators. And we love hearing these stories. We hear stories about, you know, this patient just thought that this idea was so important, they approached a researcher at a, at a local institute and partnered. We have awards set up just to fund engagement, just to have small meetings that people come together and talk about their research ideas. It's really unique. <clears throat> And we're starting to see others, NIH, HRQ, start to bring this into being and start to figure out ways to include patients along the way. So the whole pathway is so important to what we do that we really do ask everyone to send us questions. Send us questions that we should fund separately, commit in independent money, and I'm gonna talk about an example that really can help to move evidence in a particular field for a particular clinical situation. We also have patients and stakeholders involved in our merit review. It's amazing to see them speaking up about the impact that a particular application may have on their family members and on creating the evidence. And they push the scientific reviewers sometimes and say, I don't care what you're talking about, but this application is so critical. It's a little bit more than you know, the random decisions that sometimes are made in review. We're really trying to create this idea that impact matters. And our patients and stakeholders are very vocal. We pick them so that they can help to shape this agenda. We also involve them in the dissemination implementation, but I can't talk about that much because we still are generating new evidence. We don't have a lot of findings out there. We're still really new. But we do anticipate that in the legislation, because whoever wrote our law, this, this collective group that came together and wrote the law, said that we had to release findings in 90 days. Well, we have tons of research out here. All of you know it takes more than 90 days to put research findings together. But we do anticipate that once that research comes to a close, we'll have patients and others reviewing the findings to make sure they're real and relevant and understandable to the community. <clears throat> we also are evaluating what we do all the time and making sure that what we do makes a difference. And we'll have stakeholders involved in that as well. The really most important thing with PCORI is your involvement with patients and families or whoever your stakeholders are. It needs to be clear, it needs to be a partnership, that they are somebody you work with, not that you do research on, and 
just as much as your voice needs to come through in the application, their voice needs to come through in the application. There should be quotations from them or sections that they've written or their viewpoint expressed and it's really important to have that in there. And that makes it fundamentally different than a lot of other applications out there. So that was just a clip to share a story about how this matters and why this matters and how to actually do it. So, a PCORI application looks a little different, and this is what we get asked the most questions about from the research community. What is it that makes a PCORI application so different? And I'd say it's two things. It's how to do patient engagement, which I know this group knows, and the other is what are our PCOR methodology standards. We have a lot of resources on our website that you can read about and look through. But these ideas that I was taught in residency, community-oriented primary care and how you work with others, this is what we're talking about, but really how you embed it in research along the way. We also fund research that's applicable to a large number of priority conditions. So many of you may ask, well, is, how does PCORI do its funding? Well, really most of it is researcher initiated. You bring us your questions and we figure out along the way if it makes sense for PCORI funding. We also have a focus on high priority populations. So there are a range of populations, many of which I've done research in in the past in minority and diverse communities, but we also are looking at issues around rural populations and the, the um, low literacy populations. We also continue to look for key specific targeted opportunities for funding. These are opportunities like looking at falls prevention um, among the elderly. We've committed $30 million with NIH for that particular research study. We've committed about $20 million for looking at asthma interventions for disparate populations for African Americans and Latinos, trying to figure out really how to solve this issue. So we continue to seek opportunities to pull important evidence gaps into our portfolio and fund them. So I'm sure there are at least 10 or 20 relevant questions that we could talk about today. And we really do want to hear your ideas. We send them through our advisory panels, and then our board decides to commit large numbers of dollars. We have about $3 billion to commit through 2019, and we anticipate that a significant portion of that funding will go to these targeted, specific, large studies over time. These are the five national priorities for research that are built into our research strategy. These are the things I think about day in, day out. How do we really increase the evidence that aligns with these five priority areas? If you look at it, most people thought of comparative effectiveness research as comparisons between A and B, drug A, drug B, that's what a lot of people thought we would be funding. We commit about 40% of our portfolio into this area, assessment of prevention, treatment, diagnostic options. But we also have four other priority areas that we're trying to make a difference in. One is what many of you are doing research in right now. I was reading through the posters and thinking about what it means to have you know, different approaches to care. What does it mean to have the patient-centered medical home compared to community health workers compared to usual care? How do we compare those options so that people can decide, I really want a provider who's in a patient-centered medical home or who thinks about my preferences? Or maybe I'm a patient with cancer and I really want to have someone who is a patient navigator help me navigate the system. We commit about 20% of our portfolio in that area. We also have three additional areas. The communication dissemination portfolio is looking at how we put evidence into the hands of clinicians so that they can make better decisions every day. How do we really do that in a novel way? Sometimes it's an app or something on an iPad, but it really helps people take into account all the evidence and all the factors that they're thinking about. We also have a portfolio in addressing disparities. This is critically important for us to figure out important healthcare questions. About 10% of our portfolio is in addressing disparities. And we're trying to figure out not just how to go beyond documenting disparities, go beyond saying we know they exist, and figuring out clinical interventions to overcome them. 
and finally, we have a large portfolio in methods and infrastructure because we know that doing better comparative effectiveness research requires up-to-date methods and the level of standards that we're all consistent with. We're also committing a significant portion of our budget to infrastructure so that we can do research more quickly. We can create a national platform. And I'll share a little bit about the exciting work we're doing with PCORNET in a minute. So across the state, across the country, we're funding almost 400 research projects and almost a billion dollars of research. We're, we'll get there by the end of the year. But there are still some states missing, so if you're from any of those states, please come up and see me at the end of the talk. We're really trying to make sure that we're addressing issues that are relevant across the country. And I know maybe some of these don't have um, large research institutes, but I'd say we're trying to fund things that aren't at those usual suspect institutes, and we want you to really think about what questions can come from those organizations. We also don't fund by condition. We fund broadly along these national priorities. Most of our research is about $2 million worth of research awards. We fund contracts and not grants. <clears throat> but you will see that there are interesting areas that have emerged in cancer and mental health because somehow the evidence is lacking in those areas. And obviously the community has a lot of questions that align with all these different areas. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about a, a case that is relevant to our work and generated a targeted funding announcement, one of these large studies that we've committed $20 million to. So this could be a patient that any of you see. I, I just recently saw a patient like this in my clinic. 33-year-old woman presents with abdominal swelling for 10 months, has had to wear large clothes, She's coming in, trying to conceive. Periods are regular, but heavy with clots. She's anemic on exam and has a 30-week uterus. Okay, easy for this group. Um, but we know we go through the differential and we try to think about what's going on. This patient sort of knew she probably had uterine fibroids, was in her family, and she was trying to figure out what to do. What were the options? And if she came to me, she'd probably be saying, well, you know, I don't have insurance. So what really can I do about this? And how do I access care? Part of it is what does the patient want? This patient was trying to conceive, and maybe the evidence is limited on what the options are for her. Combined with racial and ethnic diversity issues, we know that three out of four women with fibroids are African American. We know that the costs of care are accelerating. They're more than costs combined for colon cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer together. But we also know that it's complicated. It depends on where the fiber it is, how many there are, whether she's had treatment before. What has she done in the past? Has she ever gotten pregnant before? And we're trying to rule things out, right, common things, but also the rare things along the way. We know that along the way, we're trying to sort through the evidence. This is not a commercial promise. <laughs> no endorsements here, no COI. Um, but these are the kinds of things we look at, or at least I look at, because I don't remember everything these days. And trying to just see, what is the evidence and what should I tell my patient is really an option. And then I need to sift through, well, what can I really get for her? I can't send my patients to the local tertiary care center because she may not be able to pay for it. And that may be too far away for her, given the other circumstances in her family. But we also know that sometimes these don't have the evidence that we need. They might try to summarize them, but maybe that trial wasn't done. So you read through the latest summary and you say, well, gosh, I really actually don't know the best answer. I wish I did, given this person's circumstances and situation. And we know that the patient may come in and say, look, my family member looked this up and told me to bring this to you. Well, that's great, but it doesn't necessarily explain what the different medical treatment options are and the combination of circumstances that exist for her. So Pokori heard this from the community. We heard this from an evidence synthesis that was generated. And we decided to fund, along with our board and advisory panel input and work groups, this large trial 
It's a 10,000 patient registry for $20 million that we're hoping will help to answer some of these questions. It'll be a prospective cohort study where we get patients who have different characteristics, those who are trying to conceive and those who are not, those who have had multiple treatments and those who have not, so that we can start to ask these questions over time and figure out where the evidence really is and how we can put that evidence in the hands of those who are trying to make decisions. So it's just one example. But it's an exciting example because this is the kind of question that comes from a community and comes from a multi-stakeholder approach to really figure out where our research agenda should be and how we commit large dollars to solve issues. We also are committing about a quarter of a billion dollars to PCORnet. PCORnet is our national clinical research network. We're really excited about this. As I walk through the halls and hear about the innovative thinking that's going on and how we're trying to be more patient-centered in all of our care, we're trying to create a platform that's patient-centered and will help create better evidence. So, over time, we're anticipating that this will be something useful to you and useful to other researchers out there. These are the two main goals. We're trying to conduct research more quickly and generate randomized clinical trial evidence, large observational studies in a more timely fashion so that people can get these rapid cycle answers over time. But we're also using PCORnet as a way to create a national learning healthcare system. Many of us like to say we dream of being in a learning healthcare system and environment where we can quickly ask these questions. What makes a difference over time? How do we really think about a PDSA cycle in real time and use evidence that's in our electronic health records? Well, this is our national effort to do this. It was built into the legislation at a, at a smaller level, and we've sort of expanded it because we have a huge vision for really making this happen. We've funded 11 clinical data research networks. Probably many of them, if, if you are connected to this at all, we probably have many patients covered across this room. These 11 clinical data research networks, we've committed about $77 million to it and plan to commit another $165 million to make this come to life. Each of these CDRNs has about a million lives covered or more. And so that will really be a large enough population to ask real-time questions. Uniquely, though, our board also said we needed patient-powered research networks. 18 of these, we've committed about $18 million. And each of them have to have 50,000 patients who have similar characteristics or conditions all in one registry, all in one group. They're going to vet the research together that eventually will be overlaid on these CDRNs and PPRNs, and we anticipate that the research that we generate will be more useful and more quickly done. We also have a new opportunity, and I hope that some of you will really think about bringing this back to your universities, because it is a huge opportunity for this group. Our large pragmatic trials are trying to pull together real-world data with real-world evidence. So we're funding these large trials, up to $10 million each, in both direct and total cost, for this cycle. And we've only started to fund them. So we anticipate funding two cycles per year going forward. And they really are well suited for family medicine, because we're trying to figure out where these questions are generated and where the evidence should be created along the way. I'm going to walk you through a few examples of these qu types of questions. But so far, we've funded nine studies. Um, this is slightly out of date as of last week. And they cover a range of conditions and populations. This is just an example. I'm going to walk you through three examples of types of studies we've funded. But how many times have you had a patient who's had a history of breast cancer, and you're not really sure how often they should have screening. Well, this study was set up to answer this explicit question. 
It's not an easy question. We don't necessarily know the evidence. And we probably usually just defer to local practice. But we're really trying to figure out what the evidence is so that we can balance risks and harms. We're also trying to seek to better understand what is the comprehensive package of care that's needed for patients with stroke. Is it all about rehab? Or is it about also having resources available to them so that we can prevent hospital readmissions? And finally, this is a very common issue that comes in, someone with acute back pain, and you're not really sure if it's physical therapy and the frequency of physical therapy that's needed, or whether it's something else that they need to be doing at home. How can we prevent the progression to chronic back pain? So I share these examples, share a little bit about who we are and what we do, a little bit about our broad funding program and our targeted opportunities. But I also think that this is one to pay attention to because these pragmatic clinical studies are large commitments. We're even willing to go higher than $10 million, but really do require sort of a thoughtful group of people to come together to answer questions that are relevant and will create an impact. So please think about how to get involved with PCORI if you're um, not yet on our merit review list and want to be a reviewer. It's a great way to get involved, review our applications, give us input on what we should be funding. But we also would love to have you involved in PCORI events. We're happy to do Speakers Bureau events and come to your institutions and talk about PCORI funding and our opportunities. We also are always recruiting PCORI ambassadors. So along the way, give us impact, input, contact us, contact me. I'm happy to talk to you about PCORI at any time. And it's truly an honor to be back here with STFM today. I look forward to the question and answers. Thank you. <laughs>